Says, get that India, big boy. Mike Asimo! Call an ambulance! Maybe call a priest! Oh, what a shot! What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. A busy week for us over at TCT as we go back to back from Easter Monday to Team List Tuesday. As always, I'm your host, John also known as 4020, and joining me on our manic little start to the week are my good mates, 60s and Quint. Uh, quite literally, yesterday was the, the last time I saw you fellas, uh, but how you both holding up after our one-point loss to the West Tigers? Well, fellas, I'm going to apologise immediately because of the internet connection. It's not unusual, but Optus has some sort of uh, blackout that's going on, some sort of outage in this area so it's not consistent, the signal. Again, my apologies if it cuts out and I don't end up participating too much in this. I, I appreciate the dedica- dedication to the course, 60s, in an, an analogy for Parramatta's performance, you know, spotty coverage <laughs> and, and inconsistent <laughs> results. <laughs> very, very good analogy, mate. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, look, I'm still, I, I still have a bit of taste in my mouth after yesterday, and we're going to talk about that in some length because... We'll jump in with a little bit of a, a review again over what happened yesterday. Quint, are you faring any better than Man 60s after what we witnessed in uh, both grades at, oh, at Combank on Easter Monday? I'm just disappointed, lads. Not upset, just disappointed. You know, like a, um, like a, like a father who's, who's looking down on his son who's um, got into, into serious trouble for the first time. That's how I kind of feel towards <laughs> our team at the moment. Yeah, that, that is an understandable feeling. I imagine there's a lot of fans that are either doing the, I'm not angry, I'm disappointed, or they're very angry. So <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> uh, either way, I, I don't blame anyone that got upset after what we saw yesterday. The Eels absolutely blew that one. And uh, as we spoke about in our post-game show with Eric Grove, uh, you know, West came in and they were committed. They were physical and enthusiastic. Mm. But at the same time, even with like, everything that West threw at us, the Eels still had opportunity after opportunity to ice that game, and they didn't. So a disappointing result there for Parramatta. We're going to get into it when we get to our Parramatta part of the podcast. But before that, as always, a shout out to the sponsors of the tip sheet, Big Swing Golf, North Mead and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Narellon and Parramatta. If the Eels get us down on a week-to-week basis, sometimes we know that our sponsors are always there for us. So thanks to the fellows at those two uh, companies. And now, boys, let's get into it as we talk Parramatta and the NRL News this week. All right, boys, let's start with the flesh wound, get the Band-Aid off and let the healing start. We'll do our weekend <laughs> recap, and we're not going to do the junior reps because our Sixties and I managed to cover them in our preview podcast because of the split round care of that Easter long weekend. We start with the NRL, the West Tigers knocking over a late field goal, care of the boot of Aiden Caesar to win 17-16, out at Combank, terrific crowd, uh, in excess of 28,000, over 28,500 actually, very, very good crowd there. For the Eels, Mike Acevo scored in the 15th minute with Quinton Gufferson scoring just after half time. Uh, Sean Russell missing the opening kick uh, for goal off the sideline and Guffo tacking on the points to his try. Uh, three penalty goals for Quinton Gufferson. Um, the unfortunately, crucially, a fourth one was missed uh, with half, uh, sorry, full time ringing out. For the Tigers, Justin Nolan bagged a double, Dream Bull scoring the go ahead try. Appy Corusau uh, kicking well enough off the tee to get him in front, two from three. Uh, there was a sin bin to Lachlan Galvin in the 48th minute for a pretty nasty hip drop tackle. Uh, boys, like we said in the intro, one that we should have won, could have won, uh, would have won if we'd done a number of things right, but we didn't. So uh, where to for the Eels from here before we get to the team list news? Look, teams will win ugly during a season. That happens. They don't play to the best of their ability. If Gutho had have kicked that last penalty goal, we would have been clocking this up as an ugly win, but hey, we got the two points. How good's that? Instead, given that 
the stats that just fill our way in such a huge manner. I mean, we can't even call it an ugly loss. It was a bad loss. Yeah. It might have been one point, but it was a bad loss because the the players, you know, like it's not even a matter of not executing. We were talking about how clunky they looked in attack yesterday in our uh, post match podcast, the instant reaction. But we really didn't do justice to how poor they were in possession. And, um, you know, it was just so many decisions that were made. I mean, we were we were full of praise for Dylan's efforts and not so full of praise for the lack of support play that he was getting uh, when he was making those half breaks. But by the same token, we also have to criticise Dylan for some some real brain fades with some of those passes and like that tap on pass. Um, after we the, scored the uh, after the, we scored. for the uh, eight point yeah. lead, yeah, it was a yeah. unnecessary. I mean, I, I was telling you that that whole play was just broken fundamentally. We telegraphed going out the back from Sean Lane to Dylan. The Tigers keyed onto it. Uh, and were able to put you know big pressure on him, so he needed to either eat the tackle or uh, you know even just let the ball go through to the winger uh, without you know touching it. Uh, yeah, and I suppose that was symptomatic of a lot of our wider issues with the team. I also thought Brad probably out out fought himself in this game too. Um, mm. You know, Junior had been an absolute demolition uh, machine off the interchange for the first three rounds. There was no reason to start him in this game. You know, just no go 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 with what's working. Uh, likewise, I mean. The, 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 op, the decision to start Kelmer over Ryan Madison, I, I'm sort of at a wash of that one. I think that uh, you could have started Maddo and brought Kelmer on as the impact player or vice versa. But I don't, I'm not sure if starting Madison and then putting him to the right edge was the right play from, in that perspective. So I think maybe in terms of the forward pack there, Brad was dealt a tough hand with Bryce Cartwright having to bow out due to that rib injury on top of the other issues of the team. Uh, but maybe he sort of outfought himself in that regard. So, yeah, look, Quint... We, we've we made a, a big deal about, you know, various key moments in this game. What really stuck out to you uh, as, like, the sort of quintessential problem with the uh, result? You mean apart from not winning? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, look, uh, there, there, there was a passage of play um, right after, uh, probably just after uh, Galvin was sin-binned, um, where uh, oh, I'm, I forgive my memory, lads. It's not really a game I want to remember all that much, to be honest. Um, but you know, all we needed to um, do was was ask a couple of questions, and, and rather than uh, playing direct to ask those questions, we were just shoveling the ball sideways, even though we had mm-hmm. uh, possession inside their um, their twenty or, or, or thirty meter line, even. And uh, it, it was in that passage of play or those couple of sets where we threw it around but did nothing and ultimately just treaded on the same blades of grass um, for, for a, a few tackles um, that, you know, uh, excuse the pun. And um, you could see it happening after the, um, uh, after the sin binning and after, um, after we failed to, to capitalise on, on the one-man overlap. That um, the, uh, that galvanised the Tigers, and and the um, the man himself um, came out and and set up what ended up being the winner, or or, so, or certainly the play that led to the opportunity for the field goal um, I, to be the winner. I accused the coach of overthinking things in terms of his forward rotation there, boys. But you get to play a sin bind for the opposition, and you go down that edge one time in the yeah. uh, the preceding ten minutes. Uh, you know, sometimes. It, got to stress it's a simple game go to the edge that's been weakened and you know has the, the confusion in defense because they've lost you know one of their key cogs in that side in their 5 eighth, and we just didn't go and, that way and and you know that if mitchell and bryce are there different types of questions are being asked yeah. in that scenario and it's you know again with you know we, we talk about young guns and uh the big showdown between galvin and talangi blaze had a very good game right up until that try they let in uh, mm. You know, again, it's a teaching moment for a young kid and, and it, it stresses the importance of having to stay in the contest for the full 80 minutes, doesn't it? Because he he sparked the early on, which probably should have led to a try for Will Penasini with a great little 
back up from an offload and getting in behind the ruck that let Quinn Gufferson get into the fr- uh, to the clear. But Guffo's kick to Pil- to Will, sorry, wasn't quite executed as well as Guffo would have liked, which led to a turnover rather than a, a four pointer. Uh, and he had plenty of other great moments in this game, but you, you go to sleep for one play, and that was all the Tigers needed to get in front. I might also add as well, in that period where uh, the 10 minutes that Galvin was off the field, um, and, and, you, and you touched on it there, Forty, that you know, we, we didn't even, um, uh, or we visited down the, the our right edge, the Tigers' left edge once. Will Pendicini was was having a bit of a day against Justin Nolan. Yeah. I know he got the, the he got two tries himself, but you know, um, that stat doesn't actually probably read how the day was really unfolding because... Will was finding plenty of space and making plenty of meters and looked very likely all day out there. And you, you, it, it, it was it was made for a moment there to be um, created, and it just wasn't. No, I think that's fair. Uh, in the first half in particular, Will was giving uh, Justin Olam an absolute bath out there. was uh, probably averaging about 15, 16 meters a run, it felt like, if not more. Uh, so again, he, you know, he was doing to Olam what uh, Tango uh, yeah, did was, to yeah, Kelma a couple it, weeks ago. Exactly, and you know, again, simple game sometimes. M- most of the time, you have a mismatch, exploit it. And uh, the Eels got a little bit too cute in that regard, and maybe they were caught in the uh, the new systems it installed to try and compensate for the loss of Mitchell Moses, and you know, thus weren't reading the game as naturally as they should have, but. Either way, it got away from him, and uh, and I suppose the last sticking point was the fact that we actually caught Api Corusau on uh, the penultimate tackle of the set uh, before the field goal, which I thought might have opened the door, opened the door for even more kick pressure on the back of a you know not sharp dummy half pass. Instead, the Eels were caught flat-footed, and uh, Aiden Caesar put off an absolute uh, uh, Sean Timmons tier uh, drop kick that. Barely got over the uh, uprights without any kick pressure. So, you know, imagine if it was someone in his face. Uh, and unfortunately, the Eels, yeah. the Eels didn't get there. And and not only if some like if someone was in his face, it wouldn't have just been the pressure. It would have been a genuine prospect of a charge yeah. down. Yeah, like I said, it was a Sean, Tim- well, Sean Timmons tier drop kick. It was ugly, flat. Yeah. It, it barely squeaked over, uh, but no one got in his face. So that, that is disappointing. Um and yeah, and um, John, can I can I just jump in as well of because um, I think it was I think there was uh, justifiable criticism of BA's uh, selections this week, and the thing that surprises me is that it was selections that were un BA like, and what I mean by that is we know that. Brad's not one for making a lot of changes, that especially unnecessary changes. Like if he has a player out, he normally tries to replace them with a minimal number of uh, positional changes or, or, or changes all up. Now, in her column, um, Shelley, uh, I've just been working on the edit to her column this week, and she pointed out that with the force changes included, there was something like seven changes to the starting lineup from the team that beat Manly. Seven. Now, there's obviously the ones that couldn't be avoided and also the inclusion of Sebo, but then there were all those changes around the starting lineup and the and the bench composition, and they were choices. And it's been working. The, the, the bench choices had been working a treat in the first three rounds. And as I said, it just didn't seem like BA-type coaching at all. Like So that's probably where I'm really stunned. I mean, did he second-guess himself in this instance? Did he um, – and, and you basically said it before – did he overthink it? So um, I have the feeling that this week things might, you know, despite what the uh, selected starting team might look like in what's been named today, I'd be surprised if we had the same starting pack this week. Yeah, well, you point towards the pack there, 60s. I point towards the back line. 
I, I've got to think Mike Acevo has to be on close to last chance. I, I was giving him the benefit of the doubt after oh, yeah. he, he had a strong finish the last season where it seemed like the right act was red. And uh, you know, that culminated in a very strong performance against the Penrith Panthers. Uh, but after a three-week suspension where he's actively put the team you know, behind, as we saw for Ryan Madison the season before, how much of a hole that can lead to, I, I thought he was very flat coming off that one. He should have been chomping at the bit you know, tearing in on every, you know, kick return and ruck hit up. And instead he sort of, you know, just lumbered into the defensive line. That was a, yeah, not not a great way to, or not a great first impression for season 2024. Anyway, boys, we move on. Unfortunately, the loss drops the Eels to two and two in a window where they're going to be uh, desperate for every win without their star halfback for at least two months or projected to be around two months. But they weren't the only team to do it tough this week. They weren't the only team for the Eels in the senior footballs to drop the bundle with the finishing line in sight uh, in the knock-on New South Wales Cup, or knock-on effect New South Wales Cup. Uh, Eels had a terrific start to the second half to put them ahead of the Western Suburbs Magpies, but got gunned down uh, by their Western Sydney rivals to lose 32-26 to for the Eels. Jake Tungor, Dejan Arce bagging a double. Ethan Sanders and Bowie Simonson scoring. RC three from five off the tee. Uh, so the Magpies end up scoring six tries, Parramatta's five. Uh, but goal kicking still uh, would have kept them close to it. But, geez, this this has been a, almost a, a microcosm of the season in, season in a single game. Young players stepping up and, and delivering some big moments. Uh, but defensive fragility really costing the team big time. Yeah, and we saw... In that game, I don't think the Eels touched the ball. Well, hang on, I'll correct that because there was a touch that happened, but <laughs> they never had off the chip mm, kick. <laughs> they never had. They ne- never had in twelve minutes of the yeah. game. So it was basically um, a really there was a really poor set when we were leading. I think by about ten points, and uh, from memory. There was an innocuous kick that was coming in uh, from the West's Magpies. A Parramatta player got his hand to the ball, which then constituted a charge down. West got possession again. I think they might have got a six again from memory. Uh, straight after that, there was a couple of awful passes that the Magpies threw that... Um, one did one collect a, a hand of a Parramatta player and restart the count. I, I, I just remember there was like about three incidents in the in the set of six that led to um, them getting more uh, tackles. And then uh, was it in that same set that Woody got the ball and then tried to oh, offload he recovered the ball, when he was yeah, being and then, tackled right yeah. in front of the goalposts. Yes, yeah, he had, uh, had delusions of grandeur there for a split second and it cost the Eels dearly. Clint, we got to see a young man make his uh, senior football open age debut for the Parramatta Eels. Ethan Martin coming into the team ahead of kickoff to play fullback. Uh, I think it's been a theme this year for the young lads, but it was a mixed bag on debut. Uh, he caught, the, uh, got caught in the, uh, I suppose, the spotlights at the end of the game with a high kick they allowed to bounce. But prior to that, I thought he put together a pretty good body of work, uh, including some seriously impressive speed and footwork. He was incredibly energetic and, you know, he, he was um, in every play, you know. He, he, I, um, dare, dare I say, like our um, custodian in first grade and our uh, club captain in Clint Gutherson, he was um, energised and, um, and and competing on everything and, and, and being very involved, you know, and, um, yeah, look, you know, when you when you're coming up a grade, you're going to make some mistakes and have some errors and things like that. But he did plenty of good things as well, and you know, mm-hmm. I think it, I think it not only bodes well for the future, but what we saw yesterday probably um, you know uh, raises some questions and I guess um, subsequently answers them. And that was certainly ones that we had. It's like, you know, um, why was he in uh, Massey to begin with? Because he he showed a lot yesterday and. Um, uh, a, a lot that I, I dare say has been missing from um, some other players within the cup side. Yeah, Ethan uh, didn't bag a try officially because he had one taken off on a pretty shoddy obstruction call where the defender chased a guy through the line, like behind the line, mm. to get the obstruction. But he did set up a nice try for uh, Bowie Simonson, I believe, uh, and was yep. 
uh, had one kick return that was shades of uh, Kalen Pong or Reese Walsh, where he stepped about half the team. It was uh, great stuff. He was uh, finished the day for nearly 150 metres off 11 carries, six tackle busts, a line break, a line break assist, and a try assist. So not a bad haul for a young man making his debut in the Cup. Uh, speaking of the young players, Sixties gave a tip before the game that Ethan was going to have a, or Ethan Sanders, sorry, we have the two Ethans there. Uh, Ethan Sanders was going to uh, find a bit of rhythm this week, and I, I think that was fair to say that you were pretty much on the money for that one, Sixties. Uh, bagged a nice solo try after half time, looked a lot more composed in this particular game, and hopefully he can use this one as a building block for the rest of the season. Yeah, my thought prior to the game was he would have been thinking that he was in the mix for halfback selection with Mitch Moses was out, but that would then be the inspiration for him to his game to a different level in the New South Wales Cup. And I think for the most part he did that. And if he can continue doing that, then he'll give Brad Arthur plenty to think about in the next week or two. And the final result on the weekend, boys, on Saturday out at New Era Stadium, the Eels blowing one against the West Tigers in the Jersey Flair, going down by two points, 22 to 24. Uh, they raced out to an early lead of tries to Dom Destratus, Joshua Lynn, Charlie Sorovi, and Saxon Pryke. Uh, Lynn kicking three from four, but getting run down with tries in the 52nd, 55th, 59th, and 67th minute for the Tigers. They stormed home in this one. Uh, Eels bottling it, unfortunately, and remaining winless on the season. Uh, 60s, we weren't out there because we had a pretty flat-out weekend in general, but you do have some feedback from the game. Yeah, we had Para through and through who was out there sending through updates for us to do our live blog update match. He pretty much gave us the... His feedback was the Eels as you suggested, really let a victory slip through their hands. Defence wasn't what it needed to be in the latter part. A few tough calls against them as well. And I think that was backed up when we spoke to some other people that were there that were saying, there, look, there was some really, really tough calls in that match. However, it was a 22-4 to lead with not much more than 15 minutes to go. And... Like that just it just shouldn't be allowed to happen. So there's a lot that they need to do in the Jersey Fleet Cup because like their New South Wales Cup counterparts, they're zero and four. Yep, and unfortunately that puts the big rubber stamp on a weekend that saw the Eels fall 0 and three to the Western uh, or West Tigers and their subsidiaries being the Western Suburbs Magpies in the New South Wales Cup. Not the uh the way we had it all envisioned and planned out, fellas. But that does bring an end to the weekend recap, which moves us on to Team List Tuesday, or at least a part of Team List Tuesday. Oh, we do have a Cup Team List. All right, uh, all our waffling around has paid off, boys. We've got two or three Team Lists to talk about now. As always, we start in the NRL. The Eels taking on the Canberra Raiders in the nation's capital, Sunday, 6.15 p.m. I hate this time slot. I hate it. I'm sorry. So much. Uh, but uh, uh, quickly looking at the team list this week, boys, there are some changes as we uh, weren't too surprised to see. Uh, in the back line, there is one change. In the starting pack, there is one change. And in the bench, there is one change. So Brad tinkering with that team in the wake of all the injuries and unavailable players. Uh, we start at fullback with our captain, Clinton Gufferson. Mike Acevo, well, I think he's lucky, but he holds his place on that left flank with Sean Russell on the right. Will Penasini, as always, at right centre. Bailey Simonson comes into the team at left centre to replace Morgan Harper, who was being dropped this week. Blaze Talungi and Dylan Brown are in the halves. Reagan Campbell Gillard and Junior Barlow named to start. Please put Junior back to the start oh, to the bench though. I don't care if he's wearing the ten; that's fine. Just put him on the bench. He's so good. Joey Lassick will play dummy half. Sean Lane on the left. Ryan Madison gets the start at the right edge, which I think is a good call. Jermaine Hopgood comes back into the starting team. On the bench, Luca Moretti, Wurumu Greg making his NRL debut this season, Joe Ofengahi and Kelma Tualangi. Extended bench sees Ogden, Arcee, Hands, Makatoa and Harper uh, playing out that shadow roster. So, boys, like I said, we've got a change to pretty much uh, all phases of the team, the back line, the forward pack and the bench. Do you like them or would you have liked to have seen BA go in a different direction? I'll start with you, Clint. Well, I texted 60s during the week, um, 
going into the Tigers game and suggested a team list not too dissimilar to this. So um, this is this is uh, some changes that I like. It's something it, probably the team list as uh, as I suggested there that I hoped we'd gone with into the Tigers game. So I'm all for these changes. Um, you know, I, I I really like Woody being on our bench. Um, you know, even even if he's just given us a good 25, 30 minutes there. Um, preferably when we're, we're dominating possession because we like to have the big man running as opposed to the big man defending. Um, but, um, yeah, look, I, I like the changes. Um, it, it's good to have Bailey come back into the side, um, if not for a little bit more pace in the back line, if nothing else. Um, you know, like yourself, though, 40, um, geez, it's, it, it's, it must be close to last chance to win for Mike. He's really got a lift this week. You know, I've, 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 I want to see from Ticker there. He's up, he's up against the speedster and Xavier Savage too, so that's going to be yeah. uh, heart palpitations for me throughout this one. And even if he wasn't, you know, um, James Schiller has shown himself in his limited first grade appearances to date to be a handy player. Yes, true, true. I agree with Clint about Micah. I've spoken before about how I like to see wingers tick four boxes. Being able to catch the high ball being able to defend, being able to get across the try line, especially when they're given opportunities in the red zone, and yardage and the kick returns. Micah was ticking two of those boxes. He was fielding the high kicks and he was pretty much acing the try opportunities that he was given. Not that he had to do too much with a lot of them, but he still was close to unstoppable in the opposition red zone. His issues were his defence and the inability to make metres from kick returns or in the yardage in sets. What we saw on the weekend, well, yesterday, was Staines owned him Oof. every time Michael was given an opportunity. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's true. And it, like he was being dropped to the ground in one-on-one tackles by Stan- Staines. Now, I'm not going to knock stains in any way because he he was getting the job done but normally it takes a lot when sevo's got that line in front of him in the past it's taken a lot to stop him he's he gives he's always given value in that part of the field we got none of that yesterday and as for the as for the kick returns he's not going to get through any defender because what we're seeing is as he hits the defenders in, when he's carrying the ball up in yardage, he actually slows up before contact. He points his shoulder and hip to the ground and falls into the tackle. It's actually a surrender tackle. And yes. if he ran the ball with some of the venom that Sean Russell attempts to run the ball, he might be doing some damage. As it, as it mm. stands now... What are we what are we getting there? You could literally pick any player in a in a losing reserve grade team that would provide the same as what Micah is in the kick returns. I'm not saying in the other areas, I'm saying in the kick returns because unfortunately, I, he's lost something. He's lost something badly in the last couple of years. And that's a tough thing to be saying about Micah, but it's it's harsh, but I think it's fair. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I I thought maybe the light bulb had been flicked back on at the end of last year, and I was hoping that was going to be carried through to this season. But uh, given that he was coming in ultra fresh, you know, three weeks off because of that suspension, I thought he was going to rip in, and the effort levels were just not there. Uh, you know, Can I also say, I thought in the second half, he looked like he was a bit banged up, and... Mm. I wondered whether he was going to be selected this week. Now, we know that with a game yesterday and a team list coming out today, and they, they may not have had a chance for the players to get together at all since then um, for any real form of assessment and you know whether there's any changes to the team that's been named. I'm, I'm going to suggest that maybe there's Brad will go back to the original interchange plan that he had for the first three games this season. And that's not evident in the team list, but 
if Micah is carrying any sort of injury, I'd much rather see Morgan Harper in the centres and Bailey Simonson on the wing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm. And, I, I don't disagree. And I think, and I, and honestly, like yesterday, uh, look, we know Morgan Harper hasn't got the pace of Bailey Simonson in the centres, and that may end up being what ultimately costs him a spot. But he was done no favours by uh, Dylan Brown yesterday with that pass that uh, turned the ball over to the West Tigers for that field goal because that was a pass that should never have been thrown by Dylan. Yes. Much the same as Dylan shouldn't have gone that tap on. Yeah, we can be critical. We could be critical of the lack of of the lack of support Dylan Brown received when he was probably one of the more threatening players in attack, and he had nobody running off him, nobody looking for uh, looking to back him up as he was poking his himself through the line time and time again. Um, but Dylan is not a natural playmaker. He's he's got a great skill set, but that being able to manage a team and to organise them around the field, that falls into the Mitch Moses category. And that's why Moses and Brown are, are such great foil because Brown's that runner as first instinct. And Moses has also got a running game, much the same as Dylan's also got a passing game. But they're able to play off each other in that... Most of the time, Dylan's going to run. Most of the time, Mitch Moses is going to pass, which means that when when Dylan puts in one of his cutout passes or passes off the hip, the defence is looking for him to run. And likewise, when Mitch Moses runs, when the opposition's going to be looking for him to pass that ball off, it's it makes it harder for them to, to make a call on what either player is going to do. The, that mix is just right for the Eels. And the mix wasn't there yesterday because we essentially had two five eights playing out there. And that's just how it is with a, a player missing and no genuine halfback uh, selected. Yeah, and I think uh, in terms of the team sheet, boys, we won't go into too much more depth because obviously we have the preview podcast coming up. Uh, but Matto on the right edge, I like that call. I think it's a straightforward one. Gets Jermaine back into the starting team, which is his best position. Uh, I don't think coming off the bench serves him too well. Uh, we get to see Woody in action for the first time this year in the NRL. Quint, you like that call? Quick call, quick call for you, John. Mm-hmm. Do you think Woody's deserved the call up? I think he's been he's been good without being great in cup, and I know that mm. uh, it's it's one of those difficult things where it comes back to the idea of how much should a player that's an NRL caliber player dominate versus. Uh, you know how much they get elevate, or how much can they elevate when they're surrounded by a better supporting cast? Um, I, I don't think he's forced his way in purely on the back of the strength of his performance. But in saying that, it gives the Eels another competent middle to play uh, through their forward rotation against the Raiders, and it allows Ryan Madison to focus more exclusively on playing on that right edge at the moment, which I suppose is what the team needs more right now. And so, basically, what you're saying is. Um, although he might not have forced his way back in, you're confident in his ability to deliver at the NRL level? I think so. I think so. As long as he uh, puts away the offload 10 metres off his own goal line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quint, do you, do you like having Woody back or would you have gone a different direction on the bench? Um, yeah. No, uh, Woody, Woody's a choice I would have made. And, you know, uh, I was alluding to before that I... Um, uh, going into the Tigers game yesterday, I, w- I would have had Woody on the bench and started Maddo on the right edge with Kelma remaining on the bench as well. Um, I'm I'm not quite ready for Kelma to be um, our starting uh, second row, or should I say our our um, our first man off um, the second there's an injury uh, or next man up, I should say um, the second there's a, a injury to the edges. Um, I still think that given his experience and seniority and, and um, experience in the position, although it's not his prefer, uh, preference, that Ryan Madison should be the person who um, who we put there. And I'm very happy that we've done that this week. And in doing that, you have to um, then bring someone up to play Maddo's role in the middle. And uh, I, I think Wyrim is the, the next best option in, um, in our squad to do that. 
Um, so, uh, look, it's it's all a matter of um, having certain archetypes of forwards on there. I'm a big fan of having the um, the impact prop off the bench. Obviously, Junior's been playing that role for um, three of the four games we played this year, so it's kind of negated um, Woody being there um, previously, but. You know, he's also been coming back from injury and making his way back through some cup appearances. So it'll be interesting to see if Junior um, uh, reverts back to that role because I, 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 um, in saying that I like the inclusion of Woody, I don't like the idea of Woody and Junior playing together. I think which which um, le- was going to lead me to my follow-up question. Junior comes back to the bench hypothetically. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you starting Woody instead of... Uh, uh, I was about to say Alfie Ogden, but Joe Ofengahi. Sorry, Joe. Uh, would you start? Yeah, would you start Woody to pair alongside Reagan Camagua to avoid that combination? Yeah, potentially, and and, and most likely because you know, um, on the subject of archetypes, you want that complementary forward with each other. You know, Reg and one of Junior or Woody complement each other really well. Likewise, Joe Hoffman Gowie and one of Junior or Woody complement each other really well. You know, and then you have your choice. Um, assuming everyone was fit, one of um, Hopgood or Madison to go alongside them there as well. So, you know, it's um, at, at full um, fitness and, and full player availability, we, we, we kind of spoil for riches in that particular department. And it's it's um, it's great to have the caliber of, or, or those caliber of players at our disposal. So, look, um, yeah, big, big fan of Woody being back just as long as it's um, in rotation with Junior as opposed to in Junior's rotation. Uh, we still wait for the Jersey flag team list to come out, boys, and that might be a, a empty hope as, as it stands right now. Canberra have named their flag team, but the Eels haven't named theirs. But we do have a cup team. So let's go there as we continue our Eels portion of the NRL and news podcast there. A couple of changes now for the Eels in this one. 4 o'clock p.m. kickoff out at GIO Stadium on Sunday. This one will be broadcast on New South Wales Rugby League TV. So we have the uh, either the free trial or the subscription available. You can catch that one online. Uh, Ethan Martin will reprise his role. Fullback boys, Jake Tungle and Sam Loizu, or Loizu on the wing, sorry. Morgan Harper and Zach Sinney in the centres. Dejan Arcee and Ethan Sanders in the halves. Ogden and Makatoa in the front row of Brendan Hands at dummy half. Dan Keir, Charlie Geimer and Brock Parker getting the start at lock forward this week, round out the starting team. Matt Arthur has slipped back to the interchange where he's joined by another young player in Saxon Pryke. Good to see Saxon getting the call up. I think he's been one of the shining lights in a pretty... Uh, uh, tough start for the Jersey flag for the Parramatta Eels, so good to see him getting his dues. He's joined on the interchange by Tony Mattielli and Reese Alderton. Uh, 60s, obviously some changes there. Good to see Martin holding his place at fullback. I think outside of that uh, one bomb he let bounce, it was a really good uh, senior debut. But we see uh, one of the other standouts in the young kids there, Matty Alpha dropping back to the interchange. Is this about load management maybe and just giving him the ability to pace himself as the season starts to get into its uh, stride in earnest? Yeah, well, I think you've got two factors at play there, which is um, perhaps what you mentioned in terms of load management. I think there's also the fact that Brendan Hands hasn't been selected in first grade, and I don't think they're going to drop Brendan Hands from being part of the NRL team to being on the bench in New South Wales Cup. Of course, the conundrum is Matt Arthur was arguably the best on field in that loss to the uh, West Magpies in the New South Wales Cup yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it's, look, what I would imagine is he'd be getting more game time than, say, many Luke got last week. And, uh, look, I would... In fact, the other thing is, too, I was surprised when they interchanged Matt Arthur at the time that they did in the second half. It, because it almost that corresponded was, with the door being opened Yes, in the contest. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And anyone who was watching that game, either at the ground or on Fox, knows the calibre of the performance that uh, Bud's put in a- against West. Uh, look, from the 40-20 that he kicked to, you know, splitting them open through, um, through the middle and almost getting a a try himself, but then Dejan Arce, I think, scoring at the following play, the ball. A, a comical dive-over attempt, yeah. That, it was yeah. A... <laughs> yeah. But it was, I mean, there, there, was, a, you know, there yeah. was a way to configure the team to keep him at starting dummy half. You could have uh, put Dejan into the centre, Zach Senni to the wing, 
uh, and then kept your choice of Tungo or Louisiu on the uh, flanks there. Uh, that would have left you, you know, would have meant probably having to include many Luke onto the bench. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, maybe he's still going to get the the you know good share of minutes there. But we know that Brendan can play good good minutes dummy half too. So it'd be interesting to see how they split that timeshare, or if maybe Brendan Hands plays a small ball lock forward. I don't know. But uh, oh, Clint, there will be there will actually there will be. A rationale behind this. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, there's, there's clearly going to be a plan here. Um, Matt Arthur is, you know, as you said, six. He's one of the hot hands in this team, and even with their 0-4 start, he's been a real, real bright spot in this team. Uh, Quint we've got another young gun in Saxon Pryke making his debut. He's a rugged, tireless middle forward, capable of playing both prop, lock, and even on the edges too. He's got that versatility. Uh, what would you be looking for in a young man, a young forward like that, making his debut against a pretty good Canberra, uh, Canberra Raiders outfit? To play with plenty of energy, just to um, and you know, uh, run it like it's your last get up and, and uh, tackle like it's your last tackle. Make your presence known. You know, it's it's a really good opportunity for Saxon, and you know, with the plethora of riches in the forwards in um, the club at the moment, um, even someone with his pedigree has to make himself known. And you know, it's not about overplaying your hand, but it's just about doing everything with as much energy as possible. And you know. Um, Saxon's known for having a, a a big work ethic, and you'd look for him to bring that into this grade as well. Yep, and this one you can catch, as I said, uh, on New South Wales Rugby TV, and obviously we're going to do a big breakdown of the game in our preview podcast. We still wait for the Jersey flag one last click before we move on. Uh, no, just the entire team's listed in the out section on New South Wales Rugby League.com.au. So, uh, yeah, we, we move on with our business now. And we go to the next thing on the tip sheet, and it's big news, boys. Uh, I, I sent 60s a message earlier today saying, mate, your phone's about to start blowing up. And that's because the Dragons and Zach Lomax have come to at least a partial agreement on a release. It's not an immediate release, but he will be freed from his contractual obligations with the St. George Illawarra Dragons from season 2025 and beyond. He becomes a free agent. Uh, but they do stress in their release or alongside their release that they are not considering an immediate release unless another club comes to the table with a considerable compensation package in terms of players coming uh, their way or player coming their way. Uh, boys, this is obviously a big step forwards for whichever club, whether it's the Parramatta, St. George or Man... I was St. George, the Roosters, gosh, uh, or Manly, who have been the three I've seen linked the most in the media to uh, acquire the athletic centre or winger. He ascribed himself as a centre, but he's done a very good job on the flanks for the Dragons. Uh, Eels, we know, want him, uh, but obviously you still got to give something up to get him. So where does that leave us, 60s? What, if you're reading the tea leaves right now, if you're pulling the, the, the cards from the deck, what sort of hand do the Eels have to play right now? Two of clubs. You're going to have to elaborate on that one there because that, that could be uh, taken a few different ways, actually. <laughs> well, uh, let's just uh, let's just say we're not we're not busting out an ace in this in this hand. But I I think if the dragons stick to their stick to their guns in terms of wanting a player swap or. or or a player involved in this trade, you have to remember that the Eels are now sitting with 27 players in their roster. We we don't want to be going backwards or maintaining the status quo. I, I don't think we'd want to be weakening a strength because if they're talking about getting a prime forward from the Eels, I doubt that the Eels are going to, to give up an area where they have an advantage, and if they're if they're asking for us to give up, say um, any of our NRL forwards, and and I'm talking about obvious, they they'd, they'd obviously be wanting someone like a Ryan Madison, a Junior Paulo, um, an RCG, like somewhere in that vicinity. Because didn't they say they were after a top three? player from a roster they're I mean they're they'd be kidding to be expecting something like that to be given I would be stunned 
if the Eels came to the party there, um, which makes me think he's heading elsewhere. That's just that's just my gut reaction on it. I might be way off the maybe the maybe the club have all intentions of of swapping out a player. I just don't see it happening. We're certainly not going to be swapping a back, <laughs> and and I just can't see them swapping a a high profile forward. I really don't. So, um, I mean, what what do you think, fellas? Yeah, I, I agree. Clearly, it's not going to be a back as much as you know we might have issues of our or take issues of certain you know certain aspects of each of the the backline players have been critical of uh, on this podcast and prior. Uh, you, you can't get a player and then lose a player in a position where you're asking for more depth, uh, whether it's you know yeah. top line depth or actual depth. Uh, so yeah, it then then becomes a moment or question of where do you set your value as a as the club as the Parramatta Reels? The Dragons is saying that you have to give us a top tier player, and I think Flanagan was outrageously quoting it has to be a top three player. Uh, you know, just this weekend past, which no club's giving up, whether it's Parramatta, whether it's the Roosters, whether it's Manly. You know, you, you, they're not getting Dylan Brown, Mitchell Moses, Quinton Gufferson, you know, anyone in that calibre. But you have to draw that line where you would be accepting a player swap. You know, it, is it a Wiramu Greg? Is it a Ryan Madison? Like, that seems too rich at that at those two points there. Um, Eels obviously have someone like Offie Ogden or Mac Hesse Makatoa, who are very competent players uh, that can play quality first grade. Uh, you know, in in batches of four to six games, is that someone the Dragons are interested in? So I have to wait and see how that plays out. I, that doesn't seem like. Well, I would suggest I would suggest no, they wouldn't be. Yeah, exactly. And that that's the, the the counterpoint to it is, the Dragons will say, well, that doesn't improve us enough, which is understandable. Uh, so it becomes a stalemate, and uh, yeah, I don't know. And again, look, the fact that he's now a free, I will save his sixties when that eight hundred thousand dollar offer was, and the the almost the threat of that sort of hung over. The acquisition of Zach Lomax, uh, for me, it had to be he, we get him this year and it makes or breaks the deal. If you don't get him for this season, I wouldn't I want to know part of him. Now that he's a, uh, the way it reads is that he's an out and out free agent and can negotiate a new deal elsewhere. That means you could bring him in for season 2025 on a deal that's more consumer with what his actual value is. So if that's the case, I think that now opens a different door to negotiate for next year without bolstering this year. So that's a, it now becomes a completely different uh, argument in that regard for mine. But we have to wait and see how that plays out because obviously there's Sunia Taruva on the market as well. Eels have a number of internal prospects that they're going to be looking to bring through for season 2025. Uh, if you can't get Lomax this year, it, it, it does complicate things. So we have to take that into consideration. Um, I think and we'll, can I just jump in there and say... Of course. We have three spots now... And with every week that passes and those spots aren't filled, it, it becomes more problematic to field a team yep. because you haven't got much space to work with if you've got a roster of 27. And if you, if you have a look at the New South Wales Cup options for BA to select in first grade what, what are you what are you actually talking about in terms of realistic options you, uh, you know that can play in the outside backs you're talking about Morgan Harper and you're talking about uh, what the next the next possibility is Dejan yeah yeah so you know like, like they've They've now got two players who are not in the top 30 and not even a development list players on the wings and at fullback. So, and, and I'm not disrespecting those players in any, in any way. What I'm saying is that we are almost totally reliant on bringing in players from outside the NRL full-time squad to fill positions that are essentially next cab off the rank for first grade. It is a, it is a concern. And I'm hoping that it's, it's like the, 
proverbial duck that's waiting where it all looks like it's pretty calm on the surface, but underneath yeah. there's a lot yeah, going on. Some serious paddling going on underneath. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And because that's, that is really what we need right now. We need reinforcements and we need them now. So when we talk about Zach Lomax, to me, I just, I have, and I could be way off the mark here. I think it's pie in the sky stuff right now. And if we sign him for next year, well and good, and that might come down to the fact that we are, we're we prepared to open the purse strings and go, you know what, you want the same sort of money as last year, we're going to give you the same money as, as, as the contract that you're on because I don't think any other club's going to offer him that sort of money. We may well be able to outbid other clubs for next season. And because of our predicament, that might be the path that we go down, Just, just – open the purse strings and sign him. Um, but as for this season, we might have another club that jump that trumps us. Yeah, and that, that, that was always... And something we've been talking about 60s is that you have a, a clear need at the Roosters. And I know that they've been they've been uh, linked to... Is it uh, Max Jorgensen? Is that the uh, young player, that the union star that they've been linked yes. to? Uh, and yeah. there's been talk about them giving him a, a lavish contract because of his immense talents. Uh, but they still would have space both cap-wise and top-30-wise uh, in that back line to accommodate someone like Lomax. So that had to be a consideration all along. And it's just a case of not getting your hopes up too high uh, when when there's a club like the Roosters in contention. So have to wait and see. The fact that he was been, he's been released from his... Oh, I do want to say the fact he's been released from his top-30 deal with the Dragons from next year onwards but no one has jumped into say they've signed him immediately, which is usually the case with NRL transactions like this. Sort of points to me that whether it's Parramatta, whether it's the Roosters, whether it's you know Manly or whoever, someone is deep in negotiations about a release for this year right now uh, with Zach Lomax, because yeah, uh, yep, that's true. Yeah, uh, it just it, that's not how it works in the NRL. If someone's released, but we've we've seen clubs undercut the other club in terms of getting getting out the signing news before the release news. It becomes this uh, massive. Uh, you know, old uh, measuring or, or, or pissing contest with uh, uh, these clubs. <laughs> uh, and, and in this case, it hasn't happened, and that's just so bizarre, and it just sets off the alarm bells saying that there's um, some serious conversations happening between the Dragons and at least one suitor. So watch that space. And, and speaking of uh, interesting signing news, there was the Mitchell Pierce, I, I want to say non-story, guys, uh, about how... Someone reached out to the Parramatta Reels about signing Mitchell Pierce. Mitchell Pierce said that someone reached out from Parramatta to him about playing. Uh, I don't know who's telling the truth or, and who's not, but uh, it made for a good headline, I suppose, for various media outlets. Yeah, and so for us now, well, it isn't a story because he's not coming. Um, and even according to the reports, uh, it wasn't going to happen. So yeah. it, it's sort of the story, the non-story that became a story. Cre- created a headline and yet, yeah, to create another headline. Yeah, and yet within the story, it's still a non-story. So <laughs> I let, we'll probably leave it at that. I, I think that's, that's a great thing to say. Yeah. And speaking of letting things lie, uh, junior reps get a week off, boys. Uh, we've got three teams proceed, uh, progressing through to the finals, uh, but they do get a little, uh, unoff- I suppose it's an official, but not a buy. Uh, wet week, whatever you want to call it, but the SG Ball, the Harold Matthews and the Lisa Fiola, all qualifying for football, all playing sudden death football uh, to book a spot in the, in the grand final qualify the week after, but they do get the week off, so no previews this week. Uh, stay tuned for next week where we'll bring you all the action and, and maybe a chat with Steve Giorgio, 60s, to frame the finals for the Parramatta Eels. I think that's probably the plan, mate. Yes, sir. And that brings an end to Parramatta News, unless there's been a bombshell dropping in the meantime. And uh, that means we can go to our halftime interlude. And it's like doing the uh, live show 60s. It's not as fun doing the halftime music after a loss, but uh, I had to rack my brains and think of something to create a theme this week because Eels having to bounce back from that West Tigers loss. You could go for the Rocky music and, you know, do the big uh, training montage. But I went for something a bit different. Uh, no halfback, obviously, is no Mitchell Moses. Eels looking to maybe steal a win here against a good team in the Canberra Raiders. So we're going for the heist theme this week. Heading off to the nation's capital, going to raid the uh, the Federal Reserves there and maybe plunder a little win. So 
We're going with the Ocean's 12 music this week, boys. Dear there. Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> the laser dance song from uh, Ocean's 12, I think, La Caution, The Other <laughs> Memph. So it's a catchy little beat to get stuck in your head there. Brings us to the back end of the podcast, boys. Not that much NRL news this week, actually. We'll do a quick uh, race around the round four recap and then go through some injury news, a, a little uh, social media feud, and then uh, the Raiders... Are they playing uh, silly buggers with the Sharks or they have something serious going on there? But we start with our round four recap. Uh, no more undefeated teams in the NRL on the back of what we saw this week. Uh, the Broncos knocking over the Cowboys on Good Friday being the cause of that one. But we had the Panthers winning 22-16 to 16 over the Roosters. That one probably wasn't as close as the scoreline suggests. Rabbitohs and Dogs played out a tough one on Good Friday. Uh, the Dragons, too good for the sequels. <laughs> uh, if I didn't know better, I'd say the fix was on in that game. Manly dropped the ball. Uh, some absurd, uh, not just an absurd amount of times, but some absurd instances of dropping the ball. They were terrible. Dolphins, way too good for the Titans after the Titans raced out to a 10 0 lead and had the Dolphins with a man down. And then we had the Warriors and Knights playing out a 20 12 victory for the home team in New Zealand. The uh, Raiders raced out to an 18 point lead. 18-0, got gunned down by the Sharks, 36-22 in a case of the uh, Canberra Faders, big time. And in the meanwhile, Melbourne Storm sat on the sidelines watching everything unfold. Boys, what were your major talking points out of this round four of NRL action? I guess disappointment for... The, well, we felt disappointment. We had company. <laughs> uh, we didn't uh, suffer we didn't suffer alone. No, we did not suffer in isolation this week. There was some uh between stinkers and heartbreaks and everything in between, there was uh some interesting results. Yeah, Clint, what was if you were to pick someone from this weekend, I'll, I'll give you two categories. One that they surprised you with what they were capable of, and two that just, oh, apart from us, that really stunk it up? Well, I'll start with the second question there, Sixties, because Manly stunk it up back. Oof. Very, very, very bad. That, that may have been one of the worst games of rugby league from, um, from them that I've ever seen. Um, I've got a good friend who's a, a Manly fan. I promise it's his only fault. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he was texting me throughout the game, just going, "I don't know what we're seeing, but if this is a prelude to what how you guys are going to play, I might feel a bit better." And then I texted him during our go- game, going, "Well, you just are Nostradamus, aren't you?" Because that's exactly what happened. Um, yeah, look, it, 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 and maybe there's something in that. I might be giving our boys a bit of a um, an out they don't deserve in saying that, but. You know, I don't think it's coincidence after the um, the, the high quality game that was um, the Sunday prior that um, both those teams come out and um, have less than their best games. On top of that, as well, boys, you know, um, it has to be said, and it's probably not something that gets touched on often enough in footy. One, winning footy games is, in the NRL is really hard, but two, the opening eight rounds is a lottery, and there's there's so many different things and different variables that affect the opening eight rounds, and. You know the the poor teams don't quite know that they're poor yet, so they um, they they jag a, uh, an upset win or two or three even, and then likewise the good teams haven't quite found their rhythm, so you know they're going to have a uh, they have a higher propensity to have their off days um, at that point in time in the season than they do in the middle and latter parts of the season. So I think we definitely saw um, something of that ilk uh, this weekend with both the Eels and and Manly. Um, my other uh, really big talking point, and I, I feel like I'm repeating myself from the week previous, but what's going on at the Gold Coast? <laughs> it's uh. like, you know, like um, De- you know, I don't know if Des was necessarily branded their savior per se, but at the same time, you know, there, there was obviously an expected uplift to happen there um, at the Gold Coast, and it just hasn't happened, boys. Yeah, no. I, I think uh, uh, the common theory was that Des would lift the floor 
to a certain level for the Gold Coast. Maybe not make them premiership contenders because, you know, post Manly, post uh, early Canterbury Des hasn't been necessarily as great a coach as he was in his prime. But he, he's always had his team to be at least some degree of competitive. And they, they've got no backbone. They've got no spine, not just from a playmaking sense, but from an actual competitive and spirit sense. They get rolled over and just get pummeled into the ground. They were up 10-0. The Gold Coast Titans had Max Plath sent to the bin for a uh, hip drop tackle, not too dissimilar to what we saw with Lachlan Galvin in our game. A real nasty hip drop tackle that's going to attract a suspension. Uh, but they they could not capitalize. And worse than that, they got humbled. They got rolled from there. You know, and the, the Dolphins aren't a powerhouse team at least to start this season. That they've had a you know produced a mixed amount. I know they're on top of the table now by way of our points differential, but they're two wins and one loss. They they're not you know, dominating. And, yeah, they got no. absolutely absolutely humbled by Redcliffe. Well, not Redcliffe, the Dolphins. Oh, is it fair to say that the Titans look like a team that hasn't bought into what the yeah, coach absolutely, is? absolutely, absolutely, oh. yeah. It, it's, it's like you're seeing, look, might be too extreme to say half-hearted, but it's it's just they don't look fully committed to what he's asking for. Now, whether he's asking for something that they don't really um, enjoy playing or whether it's beyond what they're capable of producing, I don't know. But they just don't seem to be enjoying the football that they're playing. And uh, that seems to be, I guess, the, the measure of of their performance right now. Can I also throw in there now that we're, we're talking about this early part of the season, I wouldn't mind a home game where we're not sitting bacon in the sun. <laughs> at this time of year. It, we, uh, we, we, I love Sunday afternoon football, Saturday, uh, Saturday evening football, or, you know, and on, on the occasion, Monday football in that same time slot. But please, when it's daylight savings switched over, so we're not getting absolutely baked. <laughs> it's, it is absolutely brutal in the west of Sydney in this time of year, in those time slots. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're not even thinking about the players in this. We're thinking about yeah, ourselves. Yeah. Yes, very selfishly, we are thinking about ourselves. It is, you know, it, it's not great. The, the, for people who aren't really familiar with this, the most populated part of the uh, Combank Stadium should be the Eastern Stand. And there is shade that is possible at the over, over on the western end. Well, that is in shade, but that's the corporate area. And people go into the general admission at the northern end of the ground, which gets good shade at this time of year. But if you're anywhere else, it's baking time and it's not pleasant. You're not only looking into the sun, but yeah, you, the the temperature is well let, let's just say there is a, there's a lot of people that seek refuge under the stands at the, during the breaks in the game so before the game starts there's a lot of people just hanging out and then when the halftime siren hits everyone's out of there and trying to get it cooled off in some way so i think it's been a tough draw at this time of year for all those matches but it's probably a bit better than the scheduling that was there last year yep because if you remember, they were just like we had. I think the Thursday night and Friday mm-hmm. 6 p.m. games, and that yep. was just awful for people to get to. So, I guess yeah, from yeah. a time, timing point of view, it was it's it's um, uncomfortable, but people can get there. And given that we've now had a couple of sellout games and crowds of over twenty nine thousand and over twenty eight and a half thousand in two of the three games. It's the the fans have voted with their feet about being able to get there at that sort of time. I don't know what happened with the Manly game. It was just a strange roll up <laughs> or non roll up of yeah. a lot of people. It was it was probably eight or nine thousand down on what I thought it was going to be. But I yeah. agree. Anyway, all right, boys. Just, that's my two bobs worth. Yeah, speaking of two bobs worth, there's not much uh, news worth talking about this week. But there are some funny little anecdotes going around. First one, some bad news for Luke Metcalf. Uh, one of the breakout players for the Warriors last year, had a confirmed leg fracture in his uh, well, the Warriors' victory over the Knights on the weekend. I, I, I saw that live, boys. I, I was stunned he, he broke his leg. I don't know how. 
I don't mechanically. I, I didn't see the contact that broke it. I thought it was like contact, like on the meaty part of a leg. Uh, but he somehow broke his leg, and it's going to put him out of action for a while. Yeah, yeah, and it's look, it's it's unfortunate. Um, I guess it's one of those things where maybe there was just um, the the right level of contact, if you want to call it right. <laughs> you know, the yeah, the, the worst possible, quite the, the quite little breaking point on the contact, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe there it it applied pressure at in a way that we couldn't see. But, yeah, very unfortunate for the young bloke. And I'm not sure how long we've got him listed out for yet. I'm just trying to find the Warriors press release here. But, uh, you know, that that's not obviously not a Mitchell Moses tier blow because of the difference in the calibre of play, but it's still a big loss for the uh, Warriors given Metcalf as being so strong as the offsider or the, um, you know, the sort of 2 The foil. Yeah, the, the, the foil, foil to Sean mm-hmm. Johnson. So they, they, they just specified a late season return. They haven't put a timeline on it yet. Um, I suppose it'll depend on whether he, he did undergo surgery. So that's going to extend the timeline of recovery somewhat. So uh, best of luck in his recoveries there. Um, it leads us on to our second bit of our sort of miscellaneous news, and almost trivia, I suppose. We uh, had an interesting little online feud coming out of the weekend. Uh, Jackson mm-hmm. Hastings, who, look... It, He's a divisive individual, I suppose, given his history at certain clubs. But uh, I think Andrew Voss, and, and I'm not the biggest fan of Andrew Voss, don't get me wrong here. Uh, I thought he made a pretty innocent comment in regards to catching uh, Hastings and a few other players from the New South Wales Cup game, uh, chilling and, and relaxing watching the NRL game. Uh, he, uh, I think he described uh, Hastings as maybe being a bit tired from the game and having a nap or something like that. And Hastings lashed out at him on social media. He went after him big time. I don't know if there's history between the two individuals there, but he popped off somewhat unwarranted. And to Voss's credit, and like I said again, not not a guy that's coming out here. I'm not a guy that's coming out here defending Voss on a week to week basis. But Voss was quite magnanimous and and sort of issued a mere culpa that I don't think he had the issue. So uh, I don't know what you guys make of it, but you know, well done to Voss for taking the uh, higher path in this uh, particular instance. But yeah, Hastings lashing out. Uh, pretty aggressively on social media. Do you think it was a case of Hastings didn't actually hear it himself, but someone's reported it to him Some, that the yeah. commentary, uh, because I think the deal was he was saying, I wasn't up there on the hill or I wasn't wherever it was that, you know, was. There, there's um, a, a strong chance that we've, it, I, I don't know what we call it these days, uh, but whatever version of whispers and, and whatnot that you want to call it has gone through and, you know, various different recipients of somehow, you know, altered the what was the original original sort of uh, meaning of Voss's term, uh, uh, phrase. But, yeah, Voss was quite innocent in his uh, commentary mm. there. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's – and you know what? Um, Voss was the, the victim of that with many years ago. Yeah, with he was. The, yeah. the, the uh, statue of Ray Warren. Ray Warren, yeah. Yeah, that was an ugly saga too. That played out real nasty. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, that, that was Ray Hadley. Um, really created a, a public anti-Voss campaign mm-hmm. along that. When I think Andrew Voss said something along the lines of, "Does the did that does the statue look like Ray Warren?" I'm not so sure. Like words to words to that effect, but it was it was taken as being disrespectful and you know blah blah blah. And- so in this instance, <laughs> I think uh, look, I think to be fair, and I'll, I'll be fair to Andrew Voss as well. Um, he was there was um, some criticism that was leveled at him, I think, by Shelley on our uh, on TCT, and um, I think there was a, a bit of debate uh, around that. And um, Voss basically said, like, criticism that's valid is fair, and you know he he. His attitude was, look, if someone's, if someone's, you know, has a belief and they stick to their guns, that's fine by him. So, and look, he's, I, I, I've certainly, I've, I've, you know, had issue of Voss's commentary at times because I find him to be sometimes guilty of not sensationalism or, or trying to like make a moment bigger than it is in, in the terms of the context of the of a game. But anyone that carries that attitude, six is you, you can't help but respect, you know. But oh yeah, yeah. Mm. I think he. I think what he sure. looks. I think what he looks to do is to create some talking points in his commentary, mm-hmm. 
Um, uh, like it's and and I say like you know genuine genuine talking points in that he might be playing up a a, a moment. He might play up a um, a call, a decision that's made. Um, and when I say play up, I mean put put it under the the microscope a bit, or or add a bit of colour to the description of what's going on. But I still may I, I would maintain that um, for the most part, I think he's doing it for the entertainment. Oh, we've, of, we've had it, we've had a doubt, we've had a doubt. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 as much as I, I say I'd love criticism, criticism at him. Goodness, oh my good. Um, I don't think there's ever malicious intentions of the way he approaches contrary to the game. There's clearly passion for the game there. Uh, and Clint, I suppose it's a reminder for all of us, not just Jackson, not to fly off the handle uh, when something comes your way and always uh, do a little bit of uh, fact-checking and verification. Yeah, absolutely, gents. You know, um, one thing, and you know, just putting um, this particular um, scenario aside for a second, I don't like anyone that assumes malice in things. You know, um, it, it probably says a little bit more about the individual than the supposed um, perpetrator, if you want to call uh, Andrew Voss as such in this situation. Um, you know, and um, uh, this isn't certainly uh, this certainly isn't me um, uh, suggesting that um, uh, Jackson Hastings is someone that's guilty of this all the time. But it, it kind of seems like he was in this instance. And you know, as as you guys stipulated, you know, maybe he, he received that um, information secondhand, which is. All, all the more reason that he should um, subsequently verify to make sure that that is the case, you know. And it's a good little reminder, a good little lesson, because you don't want you don't want to be a human that's assuming the worst in people or the worst in everything all the time, because then you know, you, you, you're always going to catastrophize everything. So, um, you know, ho- hopefully, um, both Andrew and um, and Jackson, outside of uh, the interaction that happened online, they've, they've, they've had a yarn to each other. Um, personally, they've cleared it up, everyone moves on, and it's a nothing thing, really. And, yeah, and I agree there, too, because I think Jackson Hastings' response in the end was all good, Bossy. So which, that's what that, made that's me That's the think correct, correct maybe, resolution, yeah. So like you yeah, said, 60s, that, perhaps... That's what, made me, that's what made me think maybe someone had said to him, yeah. look, it, you, someone's gone off at you, uh, you know, made a crack about you on, on the uh, coverage... He's he's had a crack, and and because I don't think he mentioned Voss in his comment, but Andrew Voss being the uh, no, caller, or Andrew Voss being the caller, owned the comment, apologised, said he didn't had no intent in it, and the response from Jackson Hastings was simply all good Vossy. So I, I assume that they had a bit of a relationship a, that was there, off obviously maybe through the um, uh, the fan uh, program uh, where Vossy does a lot of. Um, interaction with the players about their, you know, behind the scenes and and their takes on the game and and that sort of thing. So as you said, there's probably not much to that uh, it's a story. Ref- refreshingly adult conclusion to the saga. So well done yes. to, to both for hashing it out. Even if I think the mechanics before that were you know wrong, they came to the right conclusion, which is good to see. Uh, speaking of interesting, uh, maybe nothing stories, uh, we have a <laughs> the. Uh, Canberra Raiders, and look, Ricky's a good one for finding something to, uh, an angle to complain to the NRL about. Um, and maybe he has something here, but uh, Canberra, who were guilty of blowing that game against the Cronulla Sharks, up 18-0 in, in just as many minutes, I think it was, and then getting gunned down massively, uh, have lodged an official complaint or are expected to lodge an official complaint with the NRL in regards to that try that took them from 18 to 22 points later in the game. Uh been uh, influenced by a trainer running at the kicker or running in front of the kicker as he approached, uh, I believe, Jamal Fogarty from the sideline, approached his kick. He ended up striking the uprights and missing. And I, I think that uh, you know wasn't necessarily influential on the end result but would have helped bridge the gap somewhat for the Raiders. And it was, I say this has been interesting because the Parramatta Eels are actually cited in the article because uh, Steve Murphy, who's been a mainstay of the club for... Uh, Brad Arthur's tenure here uh, was actually fined for that against the Penrith Panthers back in 2022. Uh, he uh, was uh, running water out to the players as Nathan Cleary approached his uh, uh, kick or conversion attempt, ended up missing. It was one by two. He copped a 5K fine, and uh, the uh, all clubs were put on notice from that point 
about trainers uh, interfering with potential conversion attempts. Although the article did stress that there is no suggestion that Murphy intended to <laughs> uh, upset or in, influence the kick with our Nathan Query, which I always, I always love those little disclaimers. Uh, but yeah, nothing story, boys, or is this something that the NRL needs to be uh, cognizant of? Because I, I will say this, look, when you're when a kicker is approaching a conversion attempt or a penalty shot, the uh, defending team cannot obviously infringe with inside 10 metres, nor can they actually make any uh, distracting... Uh, I believe they're actually prohibited from making any distracting moves, So, uh, which uh, would lead to a re-kick if the, uh, and the ref sees or the team that's kicking appeals. So there's... Uh, yeah, maybe there is something here for Cameron. And, and, you know, we know Ricky can be guilty of a whinge, but he might actually have grounds to be upset in this particular instance. Do you know what? There could be multiple re-kicks in every round because the number of times you see the team that's uh, behind the line start moving forward as mm-hmm. the keeper is coming in. Um, mm-hmm. it, I mean, look, if they, if they do a crackdown, woe be tied that particular round of the NRL because it will be on. Yeah. yeah. Like they, if they get serious, it'll be on because I'm, I'm sick and tired of, um, of seeing teams do it. Even our eels do it. They move off the line before the kicks mm-hmm. being taken. And I think to myself, uh, every time I've noticed that the kicks been successful and I think they tend to move off the line when it's a gimme sort of kick or close to a gimme kick, but don't take the risk that the ref... You're going to get one day, if it's not a crackdown, you still might get the time one day when the ref goes, you know what, you fellas have just moved 10 metres into the field of play as this kick was being taken. He can have another shot. What's the... I am mm -hmm. curious, boys, what is the protocol for it? Because obviously when we're para fans, we sort of look back to that game against South Sydney in the finals where... We had a penalty goal strike the uprights with the South Sydney guys being offside uh, and and whatnot. Do you have to use a captain's challenge? Can you appeal to the referee? Like, what what are the mechanics of the kicking team to lodge a complaint or an appeal in that process? Yeah, I'm look. I'm honestly, I'm not sure about that, um, but it's. Oh, I think, like, if the kicker, I think the best thing is if the to kicker point, to point it out. Yeah. Yeah, that they that they say, look, um, they're moving off the mark as I'm coming in. I've, I've done it the last couple of times I've kicked. It's distracting me. And uh, I would imagine the ref would then go to the opponents, don't move off the line and while the kick's being taken. Mm-hmm. And then if they were to do it, then it would be, okay, we were told, um, and the ref is like, you were told, then they would, but can you imagine the furor when it's if if it ever comes in that a ref actually picks a team up for doing that because everyone's going to be talking about how it happens all the time. Why is it now being well? It's like kickoffs. There's always an offside chaser off kickoffs, but they never penalise yeah. it. So the first team is going to get it done against them is going to be so upset and say, "Yeah, everyone else is doing it. Why us?" But. Uh, at some point, it's going to come up, and it's going to be real funny as long as it doesn't involve us in a negative way. Yeah. Uh, and on, on that note, because I don't want to tempt fate too much, uh, let's start wrapping things up, boys. We are eagerly awaiting any form of Zach Lomax update. It hasn't come while we've been recording, but we do obviously have that cautionary tale about other clubs potentially being in the mix, like 60s said. So don't count your chickens before they uh, they hatch. Uh, Paramount Reels looking to obviously secure Lomax, but uh, got some stiff competition. So until we get some clarity, boys, uh, that we'll catch you guys in the next episode. That'll be the preview podcast of myself and 60s. We'll obviously run our, our eyes over everything to do with the uh, Canberra Raiders this weekend, and we're still waiting for that uh, Jersey flag list. <laughs> we'll get our first look at the Jersey flag team in the preview podcast. As always, though, boys, a thank you to the sponsors of the show, Big Swing Golf, North Mead, and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Rowan, and Parramatta, fantastic partners of the Cumberland Fro. Thank you, boys, for making it happen on a earlier recording than usual. We actually recorded from when the team was dropped at 4 p.m., which is why we've been stressing the Jersey flag and cup team list. They came out, or the cup team was coming at about 5 o'clock. So uh, it's a, been a fun podcast experience. Uh, 60s did a good job navigating those uh, blackout issues with Optus. Quint, thank you for everything you've done for us this week as well. Great insight on that recap. 60s, as always, though, I'll let you have the final say. Go, you mighty eels.